My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word? This is Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and it says this. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would teach us what it means to be part of your family. And that when we read words like this in the scriptures, it would encourage us to see what you have done to draw us to yourself. And we would live out lives that give you great glory, that we would live in the joy that you provide and you would be glorified in all things because you are good and because you draw us to yourself. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so today we are going to finish Galatians chapter 3. This is week 13 of our series of the book of Galatians. And I did not plan this, but the end of chapter 3 and week 13, when we finish, we are halfway through. Again, didn't plan it. It just worked out that way. It's kind of cool. Today we're going to talk about four things. We're going to talk about babysitters, maturity, baptism, and family. It all goes together because that's what Paul talks about. Now, the last few weeks, the Apostle Paul has been talking about God's promises to this guy named Abraham, us being Abraham's children. I'll explain what I mean a little bit throughout the message in that, the Holy Spirit's power, Old Testament law, and I worry just a little bit that if you are new here this morning and haven't been here for the last few weeks that you may not grasp everything, I think you're going to be fine, all right? I think we'll bring this together. But if you have been here, you're going to hear these nuances of all the things that we've talked about start to come together in this. Because what we are supposed to understand that the law, Old Testament law, or any laws we placed on ourselves were never meant to save us. The Old Testament law was there strictly to point us to Jesus. And so Paul Paul tells us in all the verses that we've looked at so far that the law was given by God through angels, or angels is the word for messengers, so Moses or angels. That's how the law was given. But the gospel comes in Jesus, God in the flesh. And if you want to know which one has more power, it's Jesus. Okay, Jesus has more power. The Jewish people held Moses up as the greatest messenger of God's will because he brought about the law to God's people. But Paul says something amazing and really offensive to Jewish people here because he will say, yes, Moses was a mediator. And then he says, Moses was a terrible mediator. He was one, but he was a really, really bad one. Why? The job of a mediator is to take two parties who are in conflict with each other and try to bring them together. Today, when people get a divorce, sometimes they don't go to lawyers, they go to a mediator. And the mediator works around and gets things that neither people are happy with, but they can live with, and kind of bring that together. If you buy something really expensive today, typically in the contract you fill out, it will have a clause for mediation, that you're not going to sue them. You will go through a mediator. A mediator is trying to work different parties together. So how is Moses a terrible mediator in regard to the law? Well, when Moses shows up as a mediator, he really just makes things worse. That's what he does. One of the things that Paul says is that the law was given so sins, so trespasses would increase. He talks about that in Romans 5 verse 20. And so Moses essentially shows up as a mediator and says, yeah, this is really bad. You guys are really messed up. Here's some more laws. Try to do those. Good luck. That's basically what he does. Moses doesn't give any way to really be saved. It's like if you are a guy and you're married, and you're having problems in your marriage, and you go to a single friend, and you say to your single friend, what do I do? And your single friend says to you, just tell her to obey what you say. And you'd be like, well, that's why you're single, right? <laughs> and, and you're not going to call him for advice anymore, but, but if you use that advice, you might call him for a couch to sleep on or something like that, but you're not going to really, and if you follow his advice, it's just really bad advice. Well, this is what Moses does. He shows up and just says, try harder. And here's how you try harder, just obey these things. He doesn't really give any way to get out of it. And that's Paul's point. God will bring the gospel, on the other hand, personally through Jesus Christ versus Moses and angels delivering the law. Moses could point out the problem, but he could not solve the problem. And the point of us understanding God's grace as given to us in the gospel is not that the law was bad. 
It's just that the law can never produce a people who are really changed in their core. When a heart has been made new in Jesus because of what he has done, the law no longer crushes. The law no longer terrifies. It can even have a sweetness to it when you read through it. Not that we live by the law. But what I mean is, if your life is summed up in the grace and the goodness of who Jesus Christ is, if you follow him, you can read something in the law like, don't have any gods that are before me. And instead of being like, I'll follow the law, you just think, why would I want any God before you? Why? Why? You are the one who has come and rescued me. Every other God, whether it's people or work or causes, it's all false gods. They want me to sacrifice to them, to give myself to them. But you are the God who sacrificed for me. You're the one who came and saved me. You're the one who rescued me. Why would I want any other God before you? When you're reading the law and you see things that says like, um, don't use the Lord God's name in vain. That's not about cussing. This is like God saying, don't be trite about me. Don't use my name to try and further your own agenda. And instead of trying to follow the law, we say, well, why would I ever be trite about you? Why would I ever be trite about the one who rescued and saved me? And this is what Paul is getting to. So if you have a Bible, open to Galatians chapter 3. If you're using one of the ones at Element, that's on page 632. And we're going to finish out kind of Paul's things, his argument from the end of chapter 2 all through chapter 3. And this is how he rounds this out. Galatians 3, 23 to 29. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now, one of the reasons that we take so long to walk through the book of Galatians is that there's so much to it. There's so much to understand. When people don't take the time, they get thoroughly confused. There's a British author, his name is Ann Wilson, and he wrote a book called Paul, the Mind of the Apostle. He's not a biblical scholar, and it shows because it's a horrible book, uh, but this is what he writes. No commentator can explain Galatians because it does not on any rational level make sense. And that is because he's reading it from his Western perspective, not looking at what Paul was actually saying, bringing all of the scriptures together around grace. So Paul here is going to reference four things. The first one is babysitters. And this is how Paul starts the section today, which is connected to everything else with these verses. Uh, verse, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now, if you have been an element for a while, hopefully the light bulbs start to go off for you. And you see this word, held captive, justified by faith, the word guardian in the middle of that. And you're like, oh, something's happening here as we go through this. So when Paul uses this word guardian, the word guardian for these people in this age would be a household servant or a household slave whose job it was to lead the children in place of the parents, to school, to home, or wherever. Today we call that a... Babysitter, that's what we call it, or a nanny, or a au pair, I guess. Is that, I don't know, maybe that's not what, it, but I think that's what it is. Anyway, Paul says the law was a babysitter for Israel. Now, quick reminder, when we are talking about the law, when Paul talks about it, this isn't like the laws in the Constitution of the United States. This is the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. It was given specifically to Israel, and it's made up of three parts. I like to call these the ceremonial, the magisterial, or the civil, and uh, the moral. And some people go, that's not how it's, okay, whatever. Basically, for you, it's the Ten Commandments, the ordinances for daily life, and the worship system, which would include the priesthood, the tabernacle, the offerings, the festivals. The purpose of this law for the nation of Israel, I think, was for seven main points. The first one is to reveal the character of the eternal God to the nation of Israel. God is perfect. He is holy. He is loving. He is good. Second, it's to set apart the nation of Israel as distinct from all the other nations. And they would do this by how they dress, their dietary laws, and things like that. The third thing it was supposed to do is reveal the sinfulness of who we are. Because through the law, we become conscious of how we just do not ever measure up. Fourth, it's to provide a way towards to understand forgiveness through the sacrificial offerings for people who had faith in God. But what is interesting in the Old Testament is you will be told that when you 
sacrifice these animals, the blood covered your sin. It doesn't take it away. When Jesus comes and dies for our sins, he takes them upon himself, so he removes our sins from us, and it's simply beautiful. The fifth thing is to provide a way for corporate worship through these yearly feasts that it would put in there. You got a problem with your neighbor? I don't like that guy. You got to go and feast together, and when you're eating and partying, some of those barriers get broken down and you start to reconcile because God is reconciled with us. Sixth thing, provides God's direction for the physical and spiritual health of his nation. And seven, and this is the big one, for all of humanity to realize that we can never measure up to this law. We will always fall short. We will never reach God's standard of holiness on our own. The realization of that law like a guardian was to lead us to Jesus who fulfills the law. Jesus teaches us to be a people who trust in God's mercy and God's grace found in the gospel. The purpose of the law was to lead us to Jesus who is our Savior. And so in Paul's day, like I said, this guardian would take kids to school, take them home from school, keep them out of mischief after school, make sure they were kept safe. And there's a lot of cultures who still have people that do this. I know people at Element who nanny for other people. And if that's you, great. See, you're biblical. Now, sometimes a guardian would eventually become an honored member of a family. When all their duties were done, they would become part of that family. And so when we look at the law, the law is not something we're like, oh, this is evil. We look at it and say, this was an honored part of our past that God was using to lead us to himself. And I get it. Most of us do not want a babysitter. You ever have a babysitter when you were growing up and you thought you were old enough not to have a babysitter? Okay. 16 years old, okay? 16 years old, and I get my driver's license, okay? When I was 16, got your license, it's not like today. Like today, you get your license, you can't drive anybody anywhere. When I when 16, you can drive, in, you can do anything that your insurance company said you could do. So I get my license, and I got a date. And I go pick up my date with my newly minted driver's license in my Horrible 1976 Ford Courier pickup, which rattled all over the road, but neither here nor there. I get there to pick her up, and her parents made her sister come along with us. She didn't want to do it. We didn't want her to do it, but they thought we couldn't handle ourselves on our own, so we needed a babysitter. And this is, this is the thing, right? They're right. We, I couldn't handle myself on my own. They, they were totally right, but I was so irritated about it. I don't need a babysitter. God says, Israel needed a babysitter. This leads directly into the next thing Paul talks about, which is maturity. Maturity. Paul's basically point in talking about Israel is that from the time of Moses, the law, all the way to Jesus, the Messiah, Israel was a child and they needed looking after. And so Paul says, just because you needed a babysitter in childhood, Moses to the prophets, it does not mean that that babysitter still has to do the job once the kids reach the age of maturity, when Jesus comes. Jesus comes, he fulfills the law. We're no longer under the babysitter. We at last get to be God's grown up children even though we hardly ever act like it, but we get to be that. Verse 25, Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. What's the sign of maturity? We believe in Jesus. You have faith and trust in Jesus. Boom, you're mature. Who knew it was so easy to be mature today, right? But that faith in Jesus, not our works. And it's not always that we act mature, but we have the faithfulness of Jesus that has been given to us, and we trust in that, and that's the sign of maturity. God has brought all of his promises to fulfillment. The faith of a believer is the sign that a person, no matter their ethnic background, is a full and complete member of God's family. Now, it's hard to imagine, but these words were life-changing to the people who heard them. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Sons of God, children of God. That's at first a biblical title for Israel because God said, this is Israel's my son. This is my child, Exodus 4.22. So Paul jumps all again into this backstory of Exodus, God's redemption from slavery in Israel and you know, to, to bring these people out of Egypt and take them into their own country. Paul's gonna talk about all of that in the next chapter. Paul's taking their story, the foundation of who they are as a people, and he's saying this is what's gonna move us to a better understanding of salvation. So Israel, Israel. They're a people. They're in slavery to a taskmaster named Pharaoh. This is literal chains, metaphorical chains all coming together. They cry out to God. God hears their cry. God brings them out. I saw the movie The Prince of Egypt. 
eh, sort of, but anyway, brings them out. They get to the Red Sea. God parts this Red Sea, takes his people across by a definitive act that he does. He takes his people from slavery into freedom, from death into life. When you become a person who believes in Jesus Christ, God does a definitive act in your life, and he takes you from death into life, from slavery into freedom. That's what we're supposed to see. God brings them out, takes them to a mountain called Sinai gives them a mission and a purpose and an identity. He will eventually lead them through a wilderness for 40 years, takes them into a country, gives them a nation, gives them kings, and they keep rebelling against him. And so God will send Assyrians and Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all in ways to discipline them and bring them back to himself. And then Jesus comes and Paul says, all of that history, all that history from Moses to the Messiah is like the time that they needed a babysitter. But now that time of deliverance is done because you have maturity, because the Messiah has come. And Paul has had a lot of arguments to try and get them to understand law versus grace. And here he has a question. Do you want to go back to being a child? That's what he, do you want to go back? We say, yes, shave some years off, I do, but I don't want to go back to actually needing a babysitter. Do you want to go to be a slave when you could actually be free? At element, as, as a people, God has called us to grace and faith and trust in Him. We have all lived lives that at some point were a total mess. And do we ever want to go to a place where we're trying to earn our salvation on our own? Do we want to try and be holy on our own merit? Do we want to find our identity in what we do, my hope in myself and my own actions? I hope not. I hope not. One of the reasons at Element we talk about the gospel every single week. You probably feel like you just talk about it all the time because there's nothing else to talk about. We talk about the gospel because it's a mark of being a grown-up child of God, understanding that we get to be a free people. We get to live, and we've been entrusted with the responsibility to be grown-up children of faith and trust in Christ himself. Isn't it beautiful how Paul brings this together? Four of you. The rest of you are like, I have no idea what's going on. Okay, so now Paul moves into this thing called baptism. Okay, this is still part of his argument here. So how does belonging to the Messiah give us a status of being God's grown-up children? How do we become part of this? Paul explains it a little dense, but verse 26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, when he uses Christ, that's Jesus, that's, that's the Messiah, that Jesus will sum up all of Israel in himself. N.T. Wright says it like this, what matters for Paul is that someone is in the Messiah or belongs to the Messiah. In means kind of belongs to. This is not simply a spiritual state resulting from or consisting in a certain type of inner experience. For Paul, it is a matter of belonging to a particular community, a new royal family. And how is that family entered into? God's spirit, takes us and places us into God's family when we trust in Christ. A person is a son or a daughter of God. They're incorporated into Christ through faith. Now, some people, they totally misunderstand this, and they think that physical baptism is what saves you. Physical baptism does not save you. This right here is talking about what the Spirit does through faith in our lives. Our faith unites us to Christ and all of those saving benefits. This is maturity we get that comes through grace. So Paul makes this statement about the reality of how we are then placed into God's family. The word baptism, it means to sink or submerge. It's like the Titanic gets a hole in it, goes to the bottom of the ocean. It is now submerged at the bottom of the ocean. It's submerged in water. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Paul says, when you believe, the Holy Spirit comes and he baptizes us, he immerses us, he places us within God's family. And when you hear this term, baptism of the Holy Spirit, a lot of people run different ways with that. What that literally means is that God's Spirit has immersed you and placed you into God's family by a work that he himself does. That's it. God immerses us into his family. But this is also one of the reasons that physical baptism has always been so important to Christianity. It really is. As followers of Jesus, we proclaim our new identity by this concrete practice of baptism. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul again references what the Spirit does, not our act of baptism, but our act is going to reflect 
what the Spirit has done. For the earliest Christians, repentance, faith, conversion, and baptism, they were all really experienced as a single event. You believe? Boom! We're going to dunk you out here. Let's go! And they would just go and do it. This is unlike a lot of Christians today. It's like, I've been a Christian 10 years. Maybe I'll think about getting baptized right there. That's not how it worked then. Physical baptism was almost this initiation into the church family because it was a way that you were professing, yeah, I have faith in Christ. Now today, we spend a whole lot of time trying to be careful to avoid people thinking that somehow baptism saves you. It does not. But sometimes in our desire to safeguard what baptism actually is, we inadvertently fall into another misunderstanding that we don't need to or it doesn't really matter. And Jesus said, we need to baptize one another. We do it as this display of what he's done. Baptism is not like a baby announcement. Hey, everybody. It's, it's like this, this is a, a beautiful covenant between God and us and us and God's people. And we get to hang out and celebrate what God is doing in our lives. And if I can be so bold as to give you a challenge here, if you've been a professing Christian for a while and you have not been baptized, I want to exhort you to get baptized. I really do. Again, not because it saves you, because we are professing who we are in Christ, that God has immersed us into his family. Physical baptism represents that spiritual reality. In Christ, we have passed into membership into God's single family that God promised to this guy named Abraham thousands of years ago. And this is how God brings, you can sign up today at the Welcome Center. Michelle's going to be there. Talk to her. Paul says that believers in Jesus have put on Christ. That means we are now in the Messiah's family, and as a result, all of our old distinctions, whatever they are, cease to be relevant in terms of our status in that family, that we all now have the same standing before God. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That does not mean that every aspect of your human identity becomes irrelevant. Paul is aware. I'm a Jew, but I also believe in Jesus. I'm a male, I'm not a female. He understands that, but he also, what he's saying here is that that's not the basis of his standing before God. That's what he's saying. Paul understands that some people are still in slavery and some people are free. Some people are male, some people are female. The point is that all of these are irrelevant to our status in Christ. Paul is saying, whatever anyone thought excluded them from the promises of God throughout all that Old Testament law, they are now removed with what Jesus has done. Our distinctions are no longer barriers to sharing in Christ. So hear me in this. It's not that distinctions are erased. This is not a case for unisex bathrooms. This is, you can't use this verse for something like that. Jesus is now the decisive thing about who we are. Not that we're Jewish or Greek. Not that we're male or female. Not that we're slave or free. That has such great significance for how the church is supposed to function and act within the world. Because the church of Jesus Christ should really be the one place where all age-old distinctions no longer matter and we relate to one another as family. Whatever divides communities is done away with in Christ. Race, class, gender have all separated people for far too long and there's too much strife and suffering caused by all of our differences. And only in Christ Jesus do we find that reconciliation of those differences. Only in Jesus can there be unity in race and class and gender. And that leads to the fourth thing Paul talks about. See, we got there, family. Family, that's where he goes. You have, you have babysitters, maturity, baptism, and now this is family. Verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Paul ends all of this by pointing out thousands of years ago, Genesis 12, God makes Abraham a promise. We're going to have one family. It's going to be, and finally, in Christ, God brings us all together into that one family he promised to Abraham. God at last creates that in Christ. And this is why Paul again speaks about being saved by grace through faith. And he's telling the Galatians, you cannot become part of God's family by following the babysitter, by following the law. It has to be by trusting in what Christ has done in our lives, by being incorporated into Christ. We not only take on a new identity, we also stand in line to share with the inheritance of what Christ has promised us. By being joined to Christ, we become co-heirs with him. And this is, this is maybe a flow, but it all kind of comes together. This is the idea that through faith, through trust in what he has done, we get to be baptized into Christ's family. We become Christ. We relinquish ownership of ourselves and give ourselves to the ownership of Jesus. We become heirs of the promise. Boom. 
all goes together. This is how Paul is culminating all of this. And this is where this paradoxical principle, you give up your life to find it. You give up your rights to become rights to be children of God. We lay down all that we have and receive all that we could ever want. And it's simply astounding. Everything God promised to Abraham all those millennia ago is offered to us when we come to Christ. Whether we are Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, male or female, white collar, blue collar, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. What matters is, are we Christ? Are we in Him? And a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ directly translates into a passion for the unity of the church family. And Paul is trying to say, you are a family coming together. Think of how generous God actually is. We as a people, we run from Him and do all these crazy, crazy things. And yet, He offers us to be adopted by Him, and we get to be co-heirs with Christ. That's grace. He gives us what is rightly His. Todd Wilson writes it like this. He says, How merciful of Him to make the only condition, not the color of our skin, or the size of our bank account, or whether we have two X chromosomes rather than one, but whether we trust in Christ. There is nothing more relevant and practical to this identity and community and inheritance than what the gospel speaks. The result of the gospel is we get to become mature. We get to become one family. The result of the gospel is we are baptized into this family by what God's Spirit does. And I think we have to ask this question that Paul does. Are we grown up? Do we really believe? Or do we actually still want a babysitter? Because I think if we're honest about our lives, a lot of us really want a babysitter. We want to have God say, here's this tiny little dot. This is what you got to do. You got to find it, figure it out. And instead, what God says to us is, love, serve, glorify me. This is what God says in our lives. We're talking about this in my gospel community last week. And it'd be so much easier if God just said, yeah, here's a little thing. I'm going to burn a bush in front of your house. Go do this thing. Walk five feet that way, two feet that way. Dig there. X marks the spot but he doesn't. What does he do? He saves us to be a mature people that his spirit leads us so we can serve, love, and glorify him. It's some people ask God about everything. Oh God, I'm I'm buying a car. What color should it be? God doesn't care. You got to drive it. You got to drive it. It's like, oh, I got to be certain about love, serve, glorify. God, what school do I go to? Love, serve, glorify. God, how do I reach out to these people? How do I work out my job? Love, serve, glorify. That's a mark of a mature child, that we trust that we have been saved by Christ, that we have been given God's goodness, that we get to walk in the hope of renewed and restored life. And all of a sudden, our freedom expands. It expands. It doesn't contract. And I know today in our world, people will tell you, when you follow Jesus, oh, your freedom gets smaller. It does not. It gets so broad and so wide. Love, serve, glorify Him first because He rescued and saved us. And that's the mark of mature followers of Christ. We love, serve, and glorify Him. Today, we're going to invite you to communion where you're going to break the cracker like Christ's body was broken for us. You're going to dip that in the wine or the grape juice. And this is what we call a reminder of the good news, the gospel. Jesus died in our place for our sin, fulfilling the law for us, giving his righteousness to us so we get to live as mature children. And when you take communion today, I want you to remember that if you take communion. We don't pass it around the room. It's a response. You've got to get up and do it yourself. But that's what I want you to remember and take it in thankfulness. Thank you, God, for fulfilling everything for me and drawing me to yourself so that I, though I'm not very mature most of the time, I can be mature because of what you have laid upon me. If you need prayer, maybe you are someone who has always been searching for that little dot. I got to find God's will. It's going to be this little thing. and I don't find it. My life is just over. And you want someone to pray with you about that. It's going to be people to pray for you over in the lounge right across the way. You can go during the next few songs. Uh, You can go after service. They're going to be there. You got questions about anything. Baptism. You want to get baptized? We'd love to baptize you. I promise I won't hold you down too long. I will submerge you, but I won't hold you down too long. And if you love to, want to get baptized, we'd love to be able to do that for you. They're coming up in three weeks. Three weeks? 23rd. I can't do math. Obviously, we told you that. 13 verses 23, 14. We can't do it. Okay. But it's coming up. Sign up. Uh, pray with them. Talk to them. We'd love to do that because it's a celebration as a family. 
if you want to give, there are offering boxes around the room. You can give online. We do not pass a plate at Element because, as I always say, our giving is a response, just like taking communion, just like prayer. It's all a response to what God does in our heart and our life. And we realize how generous He is. We simply start to become a generous people as well in response to what He has done. And I would encourage you, grab those sermon notes, take those questions. If I lost you in any of this, I really tried not to today, but if I did, feel free to come at 1230, ask some questions, and I'll try and answer those some more for you to try and bring this all together. But guys, we have been given such a great gift in Christ. We get to be a people who are mature and live lives that honor Him, not because we are so good, but because He has first been good to us. And he gives us his righteousness. We, we are not a righteous people. But we get to have a righteousness laid on us so we become righteous because of what Christ has done. And that should teach us to live in so much joy and freedom because our great God has been so good to us. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that you would take and move us to be a people who understand what our salvation truly means. That many times when we hear the words and speak the words of what the gospel is, sometimes we're just regurgitating these words. And we are not understanding the depth of what has truly been done for us and ultimately in us. And so teach us to understand the beauty of the gospel that we are a people who no longer need a babysitter, even when we want one. And that we get to live in maturity. That we, by what you have done, you have placed us within your family. You call us your children. We get to be co-heirs with Christ. And that is simply, and I don't think that our minds can fully even comprehend what that means. And yet you still promised it to us. And so have us day by day, understand your glory and your goodness and your majesty as you continue to break us down and rebuild us to be a people who reflect who you are better to this world. Teach us to be those who listen to you and love and serve and glorify you in all things. Because you have done this great miracle in saving a people who did not deserve to be rescued and saved. And yet you brought us to yourself by your own choice, by your own goodness. And I ask that we would be those who simply become undone by understanding the goodness of who you are. And that would teach us to go and live in this world in ways that all that we do, love serves and glorifies you by how we love and serve one another. That you would be lifted up by the lives of your people as we understand our freedom that is given and found in you. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen.